I've done two of these. There's another walk passage that I want us to look at today. Um, so if you would go with me uh, to Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 9 through 14. So Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 through 14. And if you're used to me using the NIV, um, I'm using the ESV this time. So if you have the NIV and it reads a little bit different, you'll understand why. In the NIV, the New International Version of Scripture, the word that's translated for walk in the ESV is translated live in the NIV. And while it means the same thing, I like the connotation of the ESV. So we're using the ESV this time. Verse 9 says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Catch this at verse 10. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good and in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We're grateful, Lord, for the precious uh, spirit that you have given us uh, living on the inside of us. We're grateful, Lord, that you have wakened us up, that we're clothed, that we're in our right mind. Uh, I hear uh, our elders saying we got a reasonable portion of health and strength. Uh, Lord, we're thankful that you love us the way that you do. Lord, that you take the time as your children, as a loving father, you, you take the time to speak to us as your children. And we ask even now, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word. I pray, God, that you would make Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 through 14. Lord, that you'd make it come alive. Lord, that you'd make it touch our hearts. Lord, that we have hearts that feel. Lord, that you would help it to open our ears that we have ears that can hear. Lord, that you would have it to open our eyes, that we have eyes that can see. And we bless you, and we thank you for it, even now, in the name of Jesus Christ. All of us who love the Lord said, Amen. 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 Over the last couple of years, uh, I've had to have COVID tests uh, in order to be able to travel. And uh, while you are going... Uh, and, and they're not going to let you do the little, the little test where you do it yourself and wait for the little line to come up. You got to go somewhere, let them swab your nostril and all of that in order to either get into the country where you're going or any of that kind of stuff. And while you are, you, you know, you don't feel sick or anything like that. You go and you get tested and then you're waiting for the results to come back. And even though you don't feel sick, you're wondering, is the test going to come back negative? Anybody else had that, that, that piece where you know ain't nothing wrong with you, and yet you still aren't sure that the results are going to come back the way that you want? And, and so there's a little bit of uneasiness. There's a, a nervousness about the outcome of the test. And uh, I knew I wasn't sick, and yet I found myself still concerned with what was going to be. And so when I got the email saying you're negative, I was you know, kind of relieved even though I knew I knew nothing wrong with me. I think walking with God and, and having an understanding of where your walk with God is can be just as unsettling. It's like, I think I'm in good standing. 
I think I'm walking right with God. But if you gave me a test, I don't know how I would do on the test. Like, I, I, I get up every day and I try, but if you, don't test me though, because I don't, I don't know how I might, um, I don't know how I would do if you actually gave me an exam. Well, in this passage today, we're going to see that there are four benchmarks, four things that you can measure yourself against to say, how do I measure up? against these four things that we see in this text. There are things that will help you to say, am I failing? Am I below average? Am I average? Am I a little bit above average? Or am I doing excellently? Because if you had to grade yourself right now, I wonder what you would. Don't grade yourself yet. I want you to grade yourself based off of these four things that you see here. And uh, just before we get to those, those things that you're going to be looking at, the title of the sermon is How to Walk to Please God. It's not just walking, but I'm walking specifically for God to be pleased with the way that I walk. And uh, let me just tell you, you can't make up your own uh, measurements for whether or not God is pleased. Because if you let me tell it, you let me develop my own standards, God is going to be pleased because it's me. I'm your boy, 50 grand. You get what I'm saying? But no, that you don't get to set the standards. God sets the standards for whether or not we live a life that is pleasing to him. Now, I want to give you this because this sermon ain't going to be like all the rest of them that I normally do. I got one major point and then four things that support that point. Y'all with me now? Normally, I give you three points and then, then a, a, an application and all of that. There's one point and those four benchmarks that you're looking for are all part of that point. Y'all with me? So here's the point. Pleasing God must include these four elements. If you're going to please God, there are four things you got to do. I ain't saying that it, it's only these four, but according to this passage, there are four. And if I'm going to please God, I need to know what these four things are and then measure myself against them four things. Now, Paul prayed for the Colossians. According to verse 9, he says, I begin to pray for you. He, he's praying for them ever since he heard about their faith. As soon as he heard about their faith, he began to pray for them. And it says he prayed for them regularly. He prayed for them continually. If you look up at verse 3, you will see that Paul is talking also in verse 3 about praying for them. Now, Paul is praying for them after he hears about them, but he's praying for them primarily because he wants them to be spiritually mature. He wants them to be growing in their faith. He does not want them to only be good church members, but he wants them to be folks who are growing and, and growing into spiritual maturity. Some folks are only concerned with whether or not I can be a good church member. And I want to warn you today that if you are only concerned with being a good church member, you can be a good church member and not ever grow into spiritual maturity. That's a good place to say amen. Paul was not intending, he wasn't interested in the Colossians being good church members, but having them with a maturity that cannot be denied. It would be certain if Paul had his way, if his prayers were answered for these Colossians, it would be clear that they were mature. You wouldn't look at them and wonder, I wonder, is she growing in the faith? Spiritual maturity 
is characterized by continual growth. So there are some folks who feel good that they grew 20 years ago. But you cannot claim to be spiritually mature if I can't tell you the last time that God has done something major in my life in helping me to change, y'all ain't saying amen. But if I can't tell you that God has recently chastised me, recently gotten in my face and told me about myself, uh, you, you might not, because I'm here to tell you, that means now, if God ain't telling me nothing about me, that I think I'm already there. Um, it's one thing to grow. It's another thing to grow continually. It's, it's another thing to be on a never-ending path of growth. Paul wanted us, as well as them who were in close, to grow. And here it is. The growth is an indication of the invitation. If I have been invited to a relationship with God and my understanding of the relationship with God results in stagnation, it says what I think about the invitation. If the invitation now is to come and walk with me, but my understanding of the invitation is I can sit at a place of being stagnant. I don't understand the invitation. The, the almighty God, the God of the universe says, come and walk with me, live with me, have me be your God and you be my son, you be my daughter. And I say, that means I can just sit here. Uh, maybe I don't understand the invitation. Maybe I've looked at the invitation and I've underestimated what it means now to walk with God. He says now he, he wanted them to be filled with knowledge. Filled with wisdom. Filled with understanding. Y'all didn't catch what I just said. Filled with knowledge, filled with wisdom, filled with understanding. I'm not talking about I got a little bit of knowledge, not talking about I got a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of understanding. And if I got a full knowledge, full wisdom, full understanding, then it impacts the way I follow. Notice. I'm in your text. I'm in verse 9, verse 10. Notice that to walk with God in a manner that is pleasing to God, you must first have knowledge. If my knowledge about God is not growing, I can't walk in a manner that pleases him. If my wisdom and my understanding does not grow, then I'm, I'm left at an immature place and I cannot understand what God requires. Paul is essentially stressing that to please God, you got to grow up in the faith. You got to grow up. Can I tell y'all, this, this is what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, finally, brothers, we instructed you to live in an order to please God as in fact you are living. Our, our instruction, Paul is writing to them who were in Thessalonica, that is to live in a manner that God is pleased with your living. That ought to be the aim of every one of us. It ain't just coming to church. It ain't just singing in a choir. It ain't just ushering and, and, and watching the parking lot. It ain't just giving my little $5 and then walking back out the door. No, this is a call to live so that my living, my walk with God is pleasing to him. I'm here to tell you all today, the church would look different 
It looked radically different if we were all living saying, God, look down from heaven and be pleased with the way I walk. When you look from your holy place in heaven, I pray that you look down at your daughter and you're pleased. When you look down from heaven at your son, it's my desire. Every one of us should be in this place where I'm saying, God, when you look at me, I want you to be pleased. Now, he says, it's our desire to please God. Now, in verses 10 through 12, Paul listed these four elements. So the main thing is that we're trying to please God. We want to walk in a way that God is pleased with it. And walk is a euphemism for live. I want to live. I want to walk to please God. God, I get out the bed to please God. I go to work to please God. The way I drive the beltway, I want to please God. The way I play golf, the way I play basketball, the way I play my instrument, the way I talk, the way I post on social media. Whatever I do, I do it so that God is pleased. Now look at this. He says in verse 10, bearing fruit. It's a participle there. He says, bearing fruit. If I'm going to please God, I am regularly bearing fruit. Here's what this has to do with. It has to have in your inner person. The choir just finished singing, my soul says yes. The person who is bearing fruit is at a place where they understand down on the inside of me, there's a place that says, I have made up my mind that for the rest of my life, I'm living to aim and to please God. You can't do this on some whimsical approach. You have to have counted up the cost. There's some stuff I'm going to lose. If I'm going to live in such a way that I'm going to please God. And what you have determined is it's worth losing. See, the challenge for some of us is we can't bear fruit because we have considered that what God is asking us to give up is too costly. No, but, but here's what I'm telling you, that uh, there's some folks who have decided that when B goes on her concert, no matter how much she asks for, they're going to give it to her. Uh, but then God asks you to give up a little something. Uh, and you're going, God, you, you want me to give up all that? Um, here's what I'm trying to tell you is some folks talk the talk. They don't walk the walk. Y'all know church folks can talk like church folks. Like at the church, we the most holy, the most sanctified children of God. While we're at the church. Uh-huh. But, but bearing fruit happens even when I'm not at church. Um... Living for God is an action that starts in the heart. It shows up on the outside. Here's the problem, though, is sometimes we learn how to do on the outside, but it's really not coming from the inside. Let me tell you why, why that's a major problem. That's a major problem because when I'm doing something on the outside that does not come from the inside, I can only do it on my own strength, but for so long. But when God has changed your heart, you are now doing it, but you're not doing it. It's the change in you that's doing it, and you don't have to run out of energy trying to do it. Some of y'all still got your Bibles open. If you look at verse 6, Paul says to them, even that, here, here's what he says, is that when the gospel comes and you have really received the gospel, it's bearing fruit. 
So he talks to them about bearing fruit in verse 10, but he's also saying that if you really receive the message of the gospel, you cannot be in a place where you're not bearing fruit. You have to bear fruit if you have completely heard the message of the gospel. When a person has truly received the message of the gospel, it's an automatic response to bear fruit. It happens automatically. So quick question might be, am I bearing fruit? The second thing is that there's a broadening of knowledge. Your Bible says increasing of knowledge. But here's what I mean now. That means that what I know about God is moving. It's getting broader. It's my understanding about God. I'm not here this year telling you that I don't know anything more about God this year than I knew about God last year. I'm not here in God in 2023 telling you I don't know anything more about God than I knew in 2013. That was a good place to say amen. Y'all going to figure this out in a minute. But there are going to be some things now, if I'm broadening in my knowledge of God, that means I'm not standing still. I'm, I'm moving. Why? Because God is helping me to move. Some are very adept at church. Because church is their primary focus. Paul is arguing, however, that when you are truly in God, you should be broadening your knowledge of God. Can I give it to you another way? There's no way that someone who gets saved this year and don't know nothing about God last year should know more about God in a few years if you two are still growing. You know the reason they got room for first graders every year when at the elementary school is because they put all the first graders out. Uh, y'all, y'all didn't catch the point. Uh, the reason the first grade teacher got room for more first grade students this year is she put the first grade students from last year out. Some of us need to get out of first grade. Uh, need to get out of second grade, need to get out of third, whatever grade you're in, you need to move from that. It's broadening my knowledge. Here's what can't happen. I can't move you to third grade if you didn't learn what you were supposed to learn in the second grade. Uh, in fact, I'd be doing, I'd be doing wrong. Is this thing, why does this start playing music? All right, I'm going to just act like I don't hear. Now, broadening, this is that you are in a place where you are moving, you're, you're growing. Now, here's what, here's what the Beatitudes of, of Matthew is. Why do I know stuff about Beyonce, but I don't know nothing about the Beatitudes of Matthew? Why do I know the lyrics to the new songs? but I ain't learned no new verses. How is it that I've been in church all these years and I'm still saying I don't know how to pray? How, how is it I know about all the new series on Netflix? Girl, have you seen? Yeah, you got to check that one out. How, why you know everything that's on Amazon Prime but you don't know how to find your way to Thessalonians. The pastor says, turn to Thessalonians and you five minutes trying. You, you're getting one of, when you're broadening your knowledge of who God is, I know some stuff today that I didn't know yesterday. How does one broaden their knowledge when you won't ever attend spiritual teachings? How do you broaden your knowledge because our church loves to brag that we're 400 members. We love to brag that we're 400 members. But you would never know that on Wednesday night. Not even a tenth of the congregation shows up here. That was a good place to say amen. We don't even have 5% of the congregation. 
I think the night, the, this past Wednesday was my, one of our best nights. We, we almost had 20 people. But you broaden. Now, it was a bunch of people online, but even with the folks that was online, that's only 20% of our congregation. You don't broaden your knowledge when you duck Sunday school. You don't broaden your knowledge when you duck spiritual development classes. You don't broaden your knowledge when you duck Bible study and every opportunity that your church spends to invest in you and you find something else to do, you're not broadening your knowledge. So I got to ask myself, have I learned anything new? If the preacher said, turn to the book of Hezekiah, would you be looking for it? <laughs> There's a third thing that I want you to look at, and that is being strengthened. When a newborn is born, the newborn can't support his head. His neck is too weak. In fact, the newborn, since I've brought a few of them home, is completely helpless. They uh, just relieve themselves on themselves. And if you don't take it off of them, there's nothing they can do about it. They're hungry, and you put the bottle to their mouth, but they can't hold the bottle. You have to prop their head in a certain way and hold the bottle for them because at that stage, they're too weak to do anything for themselves. Here's what I've learned now, because I've raised a couple of babies, that as time goes on, that head that just flops all around because they can't control it, the neck gets a little bit of strength to it. And they have the ability to turn when they hear something and look to go, I heard something. I still can't hold my bottle yet, but I got some control over my head because I've gained some strength. And after a few months go by, you put the bottle up to their mouth and they put their hands up around the bottle because they've got a little bit of strength to be able to do it. And somewhere around five, six months, you lay the baby on its back and you come back and the baby has rolled over onto his stomach. Why? Because it's gotten some strength. And this baby is committed to gaining strength for the rest of its life. So it couldn't hold his head straight, but now because of strength, it can hold his head straight. Couldn't hold his bottle, but now it can hold a bottle. Couldn't do anything but lay on his back, but now it can flip over. Now it can pull up on the couch and begin to take steps and begin to walk and after walking, running. And after, if the baby can be on a non, a never ending battle of gaining strength, why wouldn't we be? Why would I be a member of the church of the living God and can't pray? When my family is in trouble, I don't know how to go in the closet and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm your son. And you move on behalf of your children. Move on behalf of... Why can't I do that? Why can't I pray with authority? Maybe it's because I haven't been strengthened. Why is it that my children don't walk right with God? Why is my house off the hook? Maybe it's because I don't have any strength. Maybe I've been going to church, but I haven't learned how to become strong. There comes a place where we've been in this thing for too long that I got to be able to pray. Ain't no way somebody going to ask me to pray and I'm going, I don't want to pray. Why? You in the faith? You've been walking with God since the 60s. You've been walking with God since the 80s. You've been walking with God since the 2000s. Why can't you pray? What kind of strength is scared of public prayer? No, 
when, when, when I've learned now, when, when I'm, I'm growing strong in the faith, there's got to be something now that, that pushes me. And when you gain a little bit of strength, you want more strength. You're never satisfied with, with being weak. Once weakness in you is exposed, you get on an endeavor to say, I'm going to make what was a weakness in me a strength. Uh, th there's this saying that I don't want to be the weakest link in the chain. And there's not going to be a way that I'm allowing Deacon Robinson to get stronger, but I'm not going to be trying to get stronger. There's no way that I'm going to watch Minister Moses trying to get stronger, but I'm not too trying to get stronger. There's no way that I'm going to watch you letting God make you stronger, but I'm not also trying to get stronger. Notice that the text says, according to his glorious might. That correlates with Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So the question that all of us have to be asking ourselves, if God is giving us his strength so that we can be strong, why would I be okay with being weak? So before you grade yourself, you might want to ask yourself, am I being strengthened? Am I growing stronger as I walk with God? Is there something that I can do this year that I could not do last year? So I'm learning, um, but I'm also, I'm, I'm, I'm growing stronger. And if I'm not growing stronger, why am I okay with that? Because I don't think any of us as parents would be okay with our child staying in the sixth grade. You've been stuck in the sixth grade now for three, four years. There'd be somebody who'd look and go, something wrong. Uh, this, uh, you'd be up there fussing out the teachers you know, cutting the principal's throat, you'd be up there saying, no, I ain't no way in the world my child is going to be in the same grade. Um, I might have been a rookie when I got started, but I can't continue to be in this place of being a rookie year after year after year. Can I give y'all this fourth, this fourth benchmark that you should be looking for? And that is, is right there in the text, giving thanks to the Father. Uh, so I'm, I'm now, it, and you know, that this is the thing, it's as simple as it says. Um, folks who are walking to be fully pleasing to God have no problems opening up their hearts and opening up their mouths and giving praise to God. Uh, let, let me tell you this, uh, when, uh, when, when I'm trying to impress my wife and uh, I want something extra, like I want some baked chicken or uh, whatever I might want, I sweet talk her. Uh, don't look at me, y'all do it too. You, you, uh, you say, you so handsome and uh, ain't no man got a woman like I got. And all, you say all kind of stuff when you're trying to sweet talk her. But here it is, you do that to God. You say, God, when I was broke, busted, and disgusted, it is you who stepped in and raised me up off my bed of affliction. It's you who took me from the projects and raised me up into my own house. It's you, God, that took me from a substandard education. It's you who took me from low self-esteem and now has me in a place where I think well of myself. It's you. And can I tell you this? Folks that are going to give glory to the Father could not care less about what anybody else got to say. 
I like to tell folks, if you came sitting in this section thinking you came into the quiet section, you in the wrong section. Now, I don't know where the quiet section is, but I can automatically tell you whatever section I sit in, that ain't the quiet section. It, it reminds me of years ago, I was, a, I was a Skins fan, and we out at FedEx Field, and, uh, and uh, it was a good game. I don't remember none of the details of it, but I remember this one thing. Every time the people down front stood up, if I wanted to see, I had to stand up. And there's this woman in a mink coat sitting behind me who puts her hand on my shoulder to say, I can't see. And uh, I look at her to go, well, I don't know why you telling me that you can't see because the people down in front of me stood up and I want to see, so I'm going to stand up. Now, what you do, that's on you. But I'm telling you now, when the people down in front of me stand up, I'm going to stand up. What you do, I don't know what you're going to do, but I suggest you don't put your hand on my shoulder no more. Can I tell you when I come in here, I don't care what you do, I have come in here to give my father praise. I'm coming in here to open up my mouth. I'm coming in here to lift up my hands because I want to be pleasing to my father. And if you don't want to be pleasing to yours, that's your business. I want to be totally pleasing to you. And there's no way you're going to be as good to me as you are. And I ain't going to open up my mouth and say, Lord, I thank you. Thank you that I go to bed in peace. Thank you that I wake up in peace. Thank you that I ain't living in drama all the time. God, I thank you. It's right there in the text. He says, God, you're the reason that I've been called out of darkness. You are the reason that I am now living among them who are in the light. It's because of you. Had it not been for you, I'd still be stumbling in the dark. Had it not been for you, I would not be in the light. So, Lord, I thank you. God is the reason that we're forgiven today for what we did yesterday. And I thank God today that all that dumb stuff I did, I hope you never find out about the dumb stuff I did. Can I tell y'all this? If you know all the dumb stuff I did, you wouldn't want me to be your pastor. But I'm grateful to God that I don't know the dumb stuff you did because I probably wouldn't want to be your pastor. So uh, you don't worry about mine. I ain't going to worry about yours. I'll continue to be your pastor. You continue to let me. Y'all. Yeah. Uh, I'm grateful to God. You ever take time to think about the weight of what God has forgiven you for? See, some folks downplay what they've done. They, they, they make it not that big. It's inconsequential. But you know that you didn't just smoke. You didn't just sleep around. You didn't just cuss. You, didn't, you, you did. What, whatever you did, you did it. Yeah. And uh, I thank God that in spite of all that dumb stuff I did, that his love is so big that it can overcompensate for whatever I've done. And when I think of you loving me like that, you think I'm going to come in here and sit down? You think I'm going to come in here and not open my mouth? You think I'm going to come in here and not raise my hands? No. 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 I, I don't know nothing about what you're going to do. I am telling you that it's my aim to please God and opening up my mouth to give him praise. I want him to say that boy is grateful for all that I've done in his life. Can I tell y'all what 1 Thessalonians 5 says? You already know this, but 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything. Give thanks. Now, you think it said in some things. 
You think it said in the good things. You think it said when things are, are, are going the way that I, he said, no, in everything. Can I give you all an example of what this means? Uh, there was many years ago that my finger was crushed. This, this middle finger on, on my right hand was crushed. And uh, that thing hurt so bad, I was almost crying. I'm on my way to the hospital. And, uh, and, and while I'm on my way to the hospital, I realized that four of my fingers could move. So I wasn't happy that the third finger was crushed, but I was happy that the other four were okay. Uh, y'all, y'all ain't hearing me. In everything, find a way to give God thanks. If you look good enough, you can find a way to tell God, thank you, God. I'm not happy that I'm a grandparent right now, but, but I am happy that this is going on. I'm not happy that I lost my job, but I'm happy that this is going on. In everything, give thanks. There's a step in walking to please God. First step is bearing fruit. Broadening your knowledge of God is a second step in walking to please God. A third step in walking to please God is to purposely grow stronger. A fourth step is walking to please God is giving thanks to God in the middle of every circumstance. Putting your spiritual eyes on and saying, God, I can find a way in the middle of this to give you some thanks. And it would behoove every one of us to periodically do an assessment, a self-assessment. Y'all hear what I said? It, 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 it would do good every once in a while to, in humility, say, I wonder if I'm doing as good as I think I'm doing. Because it's a shame to think you're doing well only to find out that, that you really wasn't doing as well as you thought you were doing. And, uh, and, and it's important now to ask a question and say, am I bearing fruit or am I simply going through the motions? Am I learning more or am I stagnant? Am I this year running on last year's insight? Have I been strengthened or am I a spiritual weakling? When it comes to worship, is my butt nailed to the chair? Or do I give God the glory that he is due? When I watch the game, I can pump my fist for my team. But when I come to public worship, I can't pump my fist for my God. When my team scores, I can high-five all around the room. <laughs> but when I come to worship, I'm cool and calm and collected. It would do well to say, let me look at myself and wonder, where am I in this walk with God? Years ago, I'm almost done. Years ago, I'm taking a writing class. And during this writing class, the professor makes part of the class is that you have to turn in drafts throughout the semester. And every time you turn in a draft, he gives you the draft marked all up for you to go back and to make improvements. And so throughout the semester, we're writing this one paper, but it's a big paper and he wants the paper to be done extremely well. So it's part of the learning process. Now, what he could have done is said, write your paper, you turn it in at the end of the semester, and I'll tell you how you did. I remember vividly on the next to the last submission for me, he sent me back a note that said, this paper is a B plus. If you address some of the things that I've highlighted in this paper, you can get this paper to an A. 
I was very really pleased to get back an A minus when I finally got my paper back. But it was through the process of him saying, submit me something. I'm going to tell you what I think about what you submitted. And then you have an opportunity to correct it and do something else with it. And then you turn it in again. And that's what God is really looking for us to do. We're saying, God, are you pleased with what I'm doing? No, you got some areas that you can tighten up on. God, are you pleased with what I'm doing? Yeah, you've made some improvement, but I see some in areas that you can tighten up on. And because we are continually giving it to God and having him to make an assessment of where we are, we can get to a place where we are living a life that is pleasing to him. If you don't do it that way, you stand the chance of being like one of my friends. He lived every day, went to work, did what he needed to do. And finally, he was in so much pain that he couldn't take it anymore. And he finally went to the doctor. The doctor told his family, we're going to do an exploratory surgery. We're going to open him up. We're going to look in and see what's really going on because we can't tell by the test that we're doing. And it's going to take about two hours and we'll come back to see you. In a half hour, they were back in the room looking at her. And she said, what's going on? And they said, ain't nothing we can do. It's metastasized. We cut him open, so, oh, my, just st st stitch this back up. There's nothing we can do. Had he been going for regular doctor appointments, had he been going to get his PSA level, had he been going to check what his glucose level was, if he'd been going to check what is his blood pressure, if he'd been going to say, wh where, are, where am I? All these vital statistics that you should be looking at. Well, we can do that in the physical realm. Why wouldn't we be doing it in the spiritual realm? Here's the question for you. Are you really trying? I'm talking about are you really trying to please God? Or is it just, y'all need to be happy I come to church? But that's a big difference. And, and that's not a little difference. It's a big difference between you better be glad I bring you my money. You better be glad that I do something and know, God, I want you to be pleased. See, here's what I've come to the conclusion. There's no way pastor can't be pleased because you aiming way above pastor. God, I want you to be pleased. And the deacons got to be pleased because I'm aiming way above them. God, I want you to be pleased. The choir director got to be pleased because I'm aiming way above him. I'm aiming to please God. My husband got to be pleased because the way I'm a wife to him, I'm aiming to please God. My wife got to be pleased because I'm aiming to please God. The question for each one of us, are you pleasing to please God? Are you aiming to please God? Here's the application. You can purposely set aside an hour. It's whenever you want to make an hour. You need an hour to do this. You're going to go somewhere in the house. You might go to a park. It's, it's got some good days of forecast this week. It'll be up in the high 50s. You might decide you want to go out into a park and sit there for an hour and say, God, let me have a real conversation with you about me. And I'm going to examine my life in these four areas. Am I being strengthened? Am I bearing fruit? Because here's, I'm, I'm, here's what I've come to the conclusion. If you're doing well in some of them, you're probably not doing well in all of them. Is this an easy application? You think it would make a difference on our lives if I said, I'm really going to do this. I'm, I'm going to take a picture of this. So I can go home and uh, actually say, Lord, is what I do pleasing to you?
Because the alternative is, God, you just take what I give you. I don't care nothing about what you want. Now, it sounds bad. But the truth is, we just don't say it out our mouths. When I do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it because I'm big and bad enough to do it, I'm saying, God, this is what you get. I rough it all. God, that's what you get. I say what I want to say. God, that's what you get. We ain't married, but if I want him in my bed, why is that your business, God? I wish you would say something to me. Yeah. That sounds bad, but the truth is, for some of us, that's exactly what we're doing. It's my money. I wish you would, God, say something to me about my money. I'm done. Purposely set aside some time. Amen.